Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is a frustrating game to me. It's not frustrating solely due to its general levels of challenge, rather I do enjoy that element of it, to a degree. It frustrates me because in so many ways it excels at just about everything it sets out to do. It excels so much more smoothly than I expected, but in key ways that pertain to what it asks of a player to fully complete the game. That's where it frustrates me, to the point that it begins to sour the immaculate job done here in creating a new Crash Bandicoot game. If you've already played it for yourself, you either know what I'm talking about, or have already cracked your knuckles and began typing to tell me that I just need to get good. And hey, you're right, I probably do. But if you're not aware of Crash 4's completion requirements or aware of how good Crash 4 is in general, I invite you to stick around and listen to this ramble. So I need to give two very important disclaimers here quickly, so you know to take my opinions with a grain of salt if need be. For one, I was given a PS4 copy of this game for free by Activision to talk about it on this channel, which entitled me to a PS5 version due to how the cross-buy upgrade process offered by the company for any owner of the game works. Secondly, a friend of mine actually worked on the game itself. These things don't influence my thoughts and takeaways, and I've certainly aired some of my complaints about it in front of him as recently as last night, but please do keep those things in mind as I talk. So, uh, uh, awkward, because I'm about to heap loads of praise here. But from almost every angle, Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is about the best sequel to the original Naughty Dog Crash games that I could have possibly asked for. I didn't expect it to come from Toys for Bob, the studio that delighted me with remakes of the original Spyro games just a few years ago, but by god did they arrive on the scene and show that they've got talent to spare. I almost don't even know where to start. If I tried to imagine what a Crash 4 could be like after playing the Insane Trilogy remakes, I would have imagined a worse game than this. That's how good it is. A key point here is how faithful the game is to the fun and appeal of the older games while doing just enough touch-up around the edges to enhance the experience. This isn't an open-ended 3D platformer that happens to Star Crash or even a different genre of game entirely. It's a game where you start at point A in a level and run through very narrow paths, occasionally switching to a 2D perspective to break crates, spin into enemies, and deal with the occasional hair-pulling befuddlement of swearing you just made a jump that you just barely missed. It's still Crash, after all. But for my money, it's the best feeling Crash game to play, hands down. There's a certain something to the way Crash 2 and 3 feel to play, but Crash 4 does quite a feat by making the weight and arc of a jump feel more reliable, and perhaps even air quote, less Crash, but not so much that it doesn't feel uh, unlike Crash. But when I think of those old games, it almost felt like the flip Crash did in the air was part of the consideration. It was a weird jump that led to considered jumps and a slight obstacle to get used to, but it was something very unique to the character when compared to other platformers. Crash 4 keeps the flip in the animation, no doubt, but in a way that's uh, difficult to describe. It, it makes it feel as if it isn't part of the jump. Uh, am I making sense here? Uh, is this thing on? Am I all alone? Uh, let's just keep this going. Basically, the jumps done feel good, and the levels feel incredibly considered. It's so great to play through a bevy of new, old-school crash stages and bosses. They often feel informed by what came before, uh, sometimes even outright directly taking notes, but feel like an evolution that pushes things forward at the same time. This is helped a lot by the four new masks introduced that seem to take the place of a traditional vehicle level aspect by just offering a new gameplay style that extrapolates and warps some notion of either Crash's arsenal or Crash's levels. One mask phases platforms between dimensions, one slows down time, one lets you spin forever and take real long boy jumps, and one lets you shift gravity vertically up to two times per jump. These masks are all implemented during specific stretches of stages, which is a welcome shakeup since some of these levels are very, very long. We'll talk more about that later on. But put simply, the masks are good. The permanent spin mask may be my least favorite just due to how needing to land on small platforms with a weighty landing coming in from a spin can feel, but hey, it's still fun. Speaking of alternate gameplay, aside from the swappable Crash and Goku, who play identically, there are also three more playable characters introduced, who get their own stages to muck about in. In alternate dimension, Tana Bandicoot employs a hookshot to disarm enemies, break faraway boxes, and across large gaps. A foul-mouthed dingo dial gives some epic suck and sometimes gives some epic blow to cross large gaps, 
and Dr. Cortex turns enemies into either solid or bouncy platforms with a ray gun while having a really anxiety-inducing air dash. I I'll be honest, I don't really care for how Cortex feels to control, but the other two feel fantastic, and generally, any time that I got to play as either was a delight. They play very similarly to Crash and follow most of the same level design philosophy, just with their own little tweaks and unique abilities, just the way alternate characters should be handled in the platformer. You're largely doing the same things, but it just feels rejuvenating each and every time. It's great. And uh, Cortex is fine, his levels just require a bit more thought, and I, I don't think it's outright bad, but I just wish he didn't feel so weird to move with. He isn't light or heavy, nimble or slow, great or bad, he just feels middle of the road to me in just about every way. These characters come into play both in their own playable stages and also by sometimes intersecting with Crash and Coco during their normal stages, often setting off some explosion and incidentally setting up a route for them to continue down on. We'll also come back to this later. But these characters are here due to a time and dimension hopping story that picks up right from Crash 3's secret ending. I don't want to give too much away, again, under the presumption that you're watching this video without knowing what happens, but when cutscenes happen, it's a lot like there's just short Saturday morning cartoon bits included in the game. Essentially, Uka Uka hemorrhoid screams himself to death to open up a dimension for Entropy and Cortex to use to escape their banishment. Entropy then teams up with his alternate dimension self after growing tired of how Cortex runs the whole villain business, leading to a begrudging team up between Cortex and the heroes. For a Crash Bandicoot plot, it's definitely a fan pleaser, pulling in some deep cuts along the way that I didn't expect at all, all the while it knows when to take itself slightly seriously so as to not come off as a parody of itself. It walks a pretty great line between continuing the narrative while providing laughs. It's also a bit surprising, uh, there were a couple times where I thought the game was about to just end, but it just kept on trucking with new worlds and levels, which was pretty great to experience. Also, far be it from me to tell you the obvious by now, but the game is a visual delight. Even on a base PlayStation 4 console, the game consistently ran at 60 frames per second more often than not, and the characters are animated wonderfully. Cartoony and aesthetically pleasing to behold from start to finish, the worlds are detailed, colorful, and atmospheric while keeping a consistently pleasing visual direction throughout. I love the designs for each and every new character, it's just great stuff. Alternate Dimension Tana is kind of a different character, so we'll exclude her, but everyone else basically looks better than they ever have as far as I'm concerned. The only part of the presentation that let me down a little was on the music end. There are memorable tracks, but I'd be hard pressed to hum any of them from memory. Granted, that's how I am with the original trilogy as well, but when everything else here dominates so strongly on the presentation end, it's hard not to wish it rose to higher heights than it does. But it's still good stuff, so it's really hard to actually complain. So everything is sounding pretty great, right? The levels are varied and fun, with themes that both harken back to those from the originals while pushing things forward, the controls are tight but still crash-like, the gameplay is fun, the new characters don't stray too far from what you'd want, it's a visual delight, there's like 38 levels or something including bosses I could go on all day. It's good stuff. If you're the type of player who would pick up Crash 4 just to play through its stages and story once in a while and put it down, and never worrying too much about getting all the boxes in each and every level, then I'd recommend it in a heartbeat. To a more casual player, this is far and away the best Crash Bandicoot game ever designed. It's infinitely charming and so rewarding to play from that angle. That angle being one that's almost the exact opposite of how I'd recommend playing the original games, at least 2 and 3. And it's here where things finally diverge for me. In the original Crash games, mastering each stage by learning where every single box and hidden gem are would reasonably extend playtime and reward you with extra paths, levels, or post-game narrative, and sometimes all of the above. The levels were generally short and easy to try again and again at. I, I won't say that they were always the fairest or most logical, but it often wasn't a huge ask to keep trying for things. Crash 4 is a different story entirely. So much so that the pursuit of the game's 106% completion makes it fall apart for me. And it's a shame because the game is still so good underneath all of this, but man, let's throw some numbers out here. When it comes to the hidden gems and Crash games that count toward your completion percentage, Crash 1 had 20 to collect with 6 additional color gems to find, Crash 2 had 37 with 5 color gems tucked away, and Crash 3 had 40 clear and 5 color gems. In those games, a clear gem was often given for breaking every box in a stage, and a select few stages housed the color gems that would open up paths in other stages with their own boxes to break. Then there's Crash 4. 
Crash 4 has 6 clear gems per level. Three of those are awarded for collecting up to 80% of Lumpa Fruit in a level, a fourth is given if you break every box, a fifth is given if you beat the level without dying more than three times, and then a sixth gem is tucked away within a level. So in Crash 4, there are 228 clear gems to collect, with an additional four color gems hidden about. That is a lot, but it's not so bad. The three gems for collecting the Wumpa Fruit are pretty easy to get. The hidden gems can be devious, but aren't unattainable. Dying less than three times in the level is a fun challenge, and the Break All the Boxes gem is tolerable in most levels. There are some really, really tricky hidden boxes that are either hidden in plain sight where you wouldn't think to look, or are just barely or even entirely out of where the camera can move to, and this happens often. But it isn't so bad. Like, I wouldn't call this type of box placement ideal, but it's manageable. It doesn't help either that some levels have hundreds of boxes and last for quite a while. But again, it's a daunting but inviting challenge to consider, right? Well, hey, Crash 4 has another form of content. Inverted levels. These are horizontally flipped versions of each and every non-boss level that feature a twisted visual style, new hidden gem placements, and I, I think some different box placement entirely sometimes. Oh, and all of these levels have their own six gems to find. So double that 228 to 456 gems. Oh, and there's the color gems still, but you just have to find those once and there's like four, so whatever. I don't love all of these inverted levels. There are a few different types that get used. One is an echolocation sort of thing where every jump, spin, or slide Crash does reveals the level for a bit. And in a similar vein, there's one where those actions paint a level as you go through. These are pretty neat, but some of the others are just visually upsetting to me, like this one, which not only makes me feel uneasy while playing, but it also makes some boxes harder to spot. And then some of the longest levels in the game get turned into underwater levels with this, meaning slower movement and controls and... Man, I, I can see the decision being made to help increase the length of the game. As a Sonic fan, I'm used to some pretty artificial padding to help make a game not feel too short for an MSRP, but I really think there was enough game time here even before that. But hey, 450 gems for 106% completion. Still not so bad, right? Hey, remember time trials in Crash games? <laughs> right, that's here too. In Crash 3, when these were introduced, you just had to get a gold relic for it to count toward completion. If you were nuts, you could go for platinum for bragging rights, but they weren't required. In Crash 4, Platinum is the new gold and counts toward percentage. The new Platinum here is a developer ghost badge where you can try to beat absolutely ridiculous times. They've thrown players a bone here as you only have to do the time trial once per set of stages instead of having to do it once on a normal level and another time on its inverted level, but you really, really have to learn this game to get Platinum Relics. I won't even coyly ask if that feels like enough for 106% because another shoe has yet to drop. New to Crash 4 is the insanely perfect relic. There are 38 of them and are required for the full completion. These can be completed in either version of a stage and require you to run through a stage, breaking every single box without dying once. Miss time a jump? Restart. Hit an enemy on the pirate level as you're running back for boxes as you weren't too sure where he was? Restart. Let your eyes wander for the TV for a split second at the wrong time? Restart. If this was Crash 2 or 3, this would be a pretty neat challenge because like I mentioned earlier, the stages in those games aren't too long. But in Crash 4, this is basically asking for perfection for long stretches at a time. Again, one level in this game has 441 boxes. I think that might be more than an entire world in one of the original games. Any slight mistake and you're boned. On top of the Platinum time trials and getting all 446 clear gems, and you're being asked to replay each stage to a point that approaches mastery of the game. To some players, this will be a godsend. There hasn't been a new Crash game in this style for effectively two decades, and there's a ton of meat on the bone here for those who buy a couple games a year and really, really dig into them. This is probably heaven for those players. But I'm one of those weirdos who likes Crash 3 the most because it was always the easiest to just complete in an afternoon for me. I get much more replay value out of being able to easily pop in over a few hours, complete it, and pop back out at my leisure. Nothing feels too daunting in it, uh, even so in Crash 2 also, and not much feels like a waste of my time. Crash 4? I can see Crash 4 taking dozens and dozens of hours to complete. 
and I just can't make myself want to do it. Even with a guide to find all of the annoyingly hidden boxes, and with videos showing the fastest routes and ways to play each level, that's just not how I want to do it. Those crossover character levels I mentioned earlier? Those are neat because you get to play as those other characters, but then you get pushed back into levels you've already completed as Crash and Coco with the same pathways through, just with slightly altered box placement. For this early pirate stage, you're effectively playing through most of the exact stage again, just with new hidden boxes to find. I would have preferred if they just treated these existing sections as the existing sections, where I don't have to worry about the box totals once I'm back to Crash or Coco. Those hidden boxes especially are kind of a hidden poison, because in my opinion, they change the way a player needs to approach Crash. At least, it changes during those crucial times where a player is learning all of the box locations before knowing them like the back of their hand. It's one thing to play a level in Crash 2 or 3 and curse a stray, super hidden box, but Crash 4 essentially teaches you to always be taking it slow and panning the camera, because what if there's one hidden in a tire somewhere and then you have to replay a 6 minute level just to go back and get it, and also every single other box for a gem or perfect relic. To me, Crash is at its best when you can hit a flow state and just weave through a level, getting that satisfying serotonin from bumping boxes while still managing to elegantly go through everything. One reason why I like Crash 3 so much is because it's pretty easy to achieve that in its platforming levels. In Crash 4, I don't feel like I can hit that feel of play while also fully completing a level because there's just so much I need to look out for, always, just in case. On the bright side, I think it's entirely possible to hit that flow state while not trying to hit all the boxes in a level in this game, but I don't know man, it, it just feels like a shame. It's like going to a furniture store and checking under the couch cushions of every couch for spare change, instead of just trying some good couches and making direct eye contact with the weird employee there all the while. I'm sure it's for someone out there, but certainly not me. Crash 4 is just such an interesting case in game design to me because it does so much right in its fundamentals and then makes those fundamentals almost alienating by how much it asks of a player. And again, for some people this will work. You might be one of them and frankly, it's awesome that you've got this 50 plus hour Mount Everest of a Crash Bandicoot experience you can take in and master. But for people like me, this is a game I have to play while actively setting aside things in my mind like box totals, a thing that's at the top of the screen very often in the game. This is very much so the type of platformer where I'll come back now and then, start a new save file, see the credits a few hours later, and then sigh at how much I could technically do but just don't want to. Crash 4 taught me that I will always prefer a tighter, more focused experience over a checklist in the platformer, despite my compulsion to want to check off every box. And that's okay. It's still a fantastic game either way. It's just so fascinating to me that things were handled this way. <laughs> and the best part? There's a different kind of level I didn't even mention in this video. Uh, 2D focused levels called flashback levels where you play through stages that are designed like the bonus routes in regular stages. These are basically little puzzle levels with neat little uh, dialogue from Cortex as he was making Crash back in the 90s, and I really, really enjoy them. They're a lot of fun to poke out and figure out, and the best part is, they aren't way too long, but they don't count for that 106% completion either. This game just has that much to do. So I'm curious, if you played the game, did you try to go for a full completion? Are you still trying to? Or were you in the same boat as me? Let me know all about it down below. I'm just in such a weird place with this game because I respect it so much, but I kind of give it a side eye too at the same time. But hey, if you watch this and enjoy the way I talk, feel free to subscribe. I, I think you like the next couple videos I'm going to put out. Either way, I appreciate your time hearing me out on this one, and I hope you take it easy. Do take care. A big thank you goes out to all of my patrons, and a special thanks as always to Adrian, Buckles Chucklo, Goldstorm07, Harry, Jeet, Joey, Patrick Thompson, Sven Delica, The Crazy Even, The Legend of Bruce, and Wolf Chaosan. It'd be much harder to do this without all of your support. Without all of your support.